Thank you for everyone who's um, joining this. Is the slide showing okay? Yes, sir, you're good to go. All right, very good. All right, so um, this is a session that is um, kind of topical right now because we're getting a lot of DNS attacks that are unnecessarily taking down organizations. So the whole purpose of this, uh, this kind of session is to get people to pay attention to something that people don't pay attention to. Because usually the domain name system is something everybody relies upon, but then neglects. It's like often an afterthought in a lot of organizations' security uh, work. Um, I'm gonna put these up when we get over to the Q&A session in that chat area. I'll put these up there also, but I'm putting it here so it's recorded. Uh, these materials are open to people to take uh, cut and paste slides, use them in your presentations, because the purpose of this is to put the alert out, let everybody know that there's a threat. What is a threat? Um, we're getting extortionist waves, and the extortionists could be related towards DDoS extortion, which we get these, you know, cyclical over, you know, a couple of times a year, you get the new crews to start up. We also are starting to get them in uh, ransomware crews. Um, they are being used to actually poke at people to say, please pay me. It's the whole monetization thing that we know within the first community. And DNS, if you, if you know uh, criminal behavior, they don't want to work too hard. So if they want to try to take down an organization with a big DOS attack, why send a big DOS attack against a whole bunch of anti-DOS defenses when they're sitting there with two name servers doing the minimal requirements for you know, having your domain name service up there for an RFCs and map it and take out both of those name servers and then the whole organization's down. It doesn't matter how much cloud infrastructure they have and things like that. So this is, this is kind of like the gist of the risk around here. Right now, we're primarily getting these sort of attacks via the criminal side. They're trying to monetize. But don't um, uh, neglect that the nation state actors sitting there quietly waiting for when nation state actors get, get activated and told to do things, they, they know they have mapped out infrastructure. So again, and then um, political activists, we've seen this used in the past, you know, and then, you know, who, who knows whether you're a corporate, corporate sort of violation. Now, just as a reminder, this is our DNS system. DNS system is, you know, there's no such thing as like DNS, right? What we have is we have authoritative architectures, we have root architectures, we have top level domain architectures, we have DNS resolver architectures, and in today's environment, we even have DNS architectures inside homes, right? Um, and the way things are set up. Yep. Yes. Not sure what that was, Barry. Please continue. Oh, please continue. Okay, thank you. All right. So, um, so we have these different architectures that are are happening through through throughout, right? So, um, so here we're going to be focusing on the authoritative infrastructure. This is the organization that controls your zones. Like in my case, uh, uh, Senki.org is an example, right? How do you protect that? Make sure that that that, that does not go down. So in here, what we're going to walk through is what the miscreants kind of know. This is kind of like their playbook. This is the sort of different techniques they're going to use. And we're going to do this as a, as a shorter session. There's a longer set, set of slides when we point over to the materials that, that you can use. This shorter session slides out of this, or you can use longer sessions to help explain to your management and says, we need to pay attention to these sort of things, right? Um, so in their playbook, one of the things that you see out there it, and a, a lot of people neglect is the whole spear phishing aspect of it, of going after how do you control the domain itself. If somebody wanted to go after my domain, senki.org, they can go out there and try to get my credentials to my registrar and then change everything around. We saw this um, two years ago, 2019, with the sea turtle attacks, right? Um, they're not going away. This is kind of like a, a very potent area of, of attack. And it's interesting how organizations I work with and they get attacked and you find out, okay, who's got the access to the registrar? And they'll look around inside the organization and they won't have that tracked. So this is really important. I'll point, point people to a document that was created of summarizing and, uh, the different ICANN um, recommendations for how to protect your access to your registrar, right? Um, the other thing that we've seen out there is 
um, registries and registrars and the communication mechanisms between the two, the EPP porn is also getting um, targeted. And uh, this is something that in the ICANN environment, uh, in the registry operations, the registrars are starting to pay attention to more, right? So, so this is kind of like a big brute force because it's going after a big, you know, um, it, instead of going after senki.org, they'll go after the whole .org, right? Sort of uh, infrastructure with it. Um, the other thing that you can get with spear phishing is if you get access and penetration into the system, you know, if somebody breaks into the system as, um, you know, looking for ransomware, you know, it's it's uh, one of the things that they can uh, logically do is is laterally move across the organization, gain that privilege access into the um, hidden primary DNS, um, and then they are in control of the DNS at that point, right? So they they have broken into the system, and you could have a ransomware event where they actually lock down that system or or knock it down. So these sort of attacks will will happen. Um, the externally visible DNS name servers get attacked. And this is where if you have, oh, I have two data centers and two name servers and you, you map it out there, you know, that, that, that uh, infrastructure is vulnerable to attack because they're exposed publicly. But also um, if you don't have, um, if you haven't put any thought into how to protect those, then those, those get taken out. Then you can say, okay, let's move upstream. You get a lot of uh, different vendors to say, hey, put a firewall in front of your DNS. Okay, well, firewall get attacked. Or here, I do access list on the router, and the router gets attacked. Um, when they see the name servers out in the internet, they can trace route and they can find here are the different devices that are supporting those externally visible authoritative DNS, and those become a target of attack also. That's something that um, organizations kind of like neglect. Like sometimes you'll have big infrastructure instead of the data center and you think you have plenty of bandwidth for your secondary DNS, but then um, the, the path into it gets saturated volumetric attack and it goes down too, right? So the other in interesting thing that happens is you get these um, reflections off of valid clients. A lot of times, most uh, the, the, the miscreants will use the easy path. Like today they use a open, DNS reflectors and different parts of the internet that reflect the attacks off. And it's very easy to do because we just have a, a tough time across the entire internet trying to close up these open uh, resolvers, right? But the other attack vector that people would do, the miscreants, is they'll use like inside of a service provider, they'll use all the different homes. I mean, you know, in the broad, the, the world of broadband, those are, those are high bandwidth. I mean, it's interesting homes today have equivalent of bandwidth and network technology deployed in the home equivalent to big businesses back in, you know, the late 90s, right? They're, they're, it's, it's, you know, that is all abusable infrastructure. So you'll get things like, for instance, um, a common attack vector is a pseudo random domain attack. And a pseudo random domain attack is a miscreant is actually reflecting a uh, zone uh, or uh, DNS queries off of like CPEs inside the uh, inside of a broadband network, right? So you, you, your DNS um, your DNS infrastructure is say, well, this is valid clients. Is it valid clients or not valid clients? Why why is why is this particular home sending me you know 100 queries per second on DNS, right? And then you end up having a collateral because you go out there and you'll have a throttle, and the throttle will then knock down the ability of the customer. Right to uh, to do things. So you, then you get this this complicated attack vector where two victimization with it. So when you look at it, this is kind of like the, the the crux of our problem out there. Um, is that there's a range of different attack vectors. The miscreants can map out the network and do it. So what we're trying to do is get people to do a wake up call. Um, this is kind of like an old old like seven habits of highly effective cyber criminals. If you haven't seen it, there's a link in here. I'll share the link in the in the breakout Q and A part. Uh, this is something that 20, over 20 years ago, Rob Thomas from Team Cymru and I were playing around and we started looking at different criminal behavior patterns. And this is the monetization cycle. And the idea here is with your DNS uh, resiliency is to make it where the bad guys have to work hard. Right now, the problem we have in industry is they don't have to work hard to cause a lot of damage to the DNS infrastructure of an organization to do bigger damage, right? And so our goal is to go through and find ways to actually make it harder for them. 
Because if you make it harder for them, they'll move on to some other attack vector that's easier, right? It's kind of like what, what's their monetization path with it. So from, from a resiliency standpoint, always want to try to make things work, make the bad guys work harder. Think of what you're trying to defend against. You're not defending against uh, packets, you're defending against the per people who are pushing out the packets, right? Um, so, so um, you know, the intent is a pur purpose there. So, you know, the three power recommended actions, you know, number one, don't forget DNS. That our number one problem with DNS resiliency is people, you know, have an afterthought. Um, it's it's like neglected. It's like who's your DNS people who take care of your DNS? Oh, um, and then they think, 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 and they have to think of who's actually managing their their DNS systems, right? So so um, and the people who are managing the DNS systems, they're usually jumping up and down and says, "Can I get can I get uh, resources to do things?" And they go, "No, no, we have more important things to do." And then you get a you get an attack. They hit the DNS, and then everybody complains that the DNS person didn't do anything. That's that's a situation we just need to get out of. That's that's the number one problem with DNS resiliency is it's it's an afterthought, and the people who are doing it are not getting the help they need to do, right? So so the periodic review, look at what you have, make sure you have all the the passwords, infrastructure, things like that. Um, number two is turn your DNS into a good you know, on the resolver side, turn it into a security tool. This, this is a different talk to go into there, but uh, one of the most effective tools for helping to protect not only your organization, but also keep an eye on what sort of miscreant activities could be poking at your overall DNS architecture, resolver and authoritative is, you know, uh, you know thinking of DNS as a major element in your security uh, uh, um, topology. Um, and the last one related with this, um, the days where you had, you know, uh, two name servers inside of uh, behind a T1 connection in your data center, those are over. Um, it's uh, we live in a hybrid architecture, which is mixed with cloud and edge and different topology networks and globalization and things like that. Um, you know, the place in, in somebody like myself who's been doing this for 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 decades. A place of putting your authoritative DNS that's exposed publicly to the internet is someplace in one of the cloud services out there. There are plenty of cloud services out there that you can actually leverage and use at your price range of what you need. You can go out there and search around for them um, and, and two bids out there and take basically your secondary DNS infrastructure and get it up onto the cloud. Because once you do that, you just made it harder for the attacker to go after your authoritative DNS. And then you take your authoritative DNS and stick it, you know, either you move that also to the cloud, depending on your organization, or you can do what a lot of organizations do. They just turn it into a hidden primary. They, they you know, pack security around it. They protect it to make sure people can't get access to the zones. Um, if they want to do DNSSEC and things like that, they can plug, you know, your, your key management system to it and they put it and protect it. That right there, you know, um, makes a huge difference. Like in Q4 of 2020, we had a DDoS extortion uh, racket going around the in industry. And it's interesting as you watch their behavior, um, they would poke at DNS, right? So they attack it. Then they, they come back and try to attack it again after they move up to the cloud and they move on. They just move on to a different target. Don't work too hard, right? And so that is a, is a major element to make sure they work don't work too hard. The other aspect, if you go back to 2019 and Sea Turtle, is all the different things to make sure between you and your registrar is taken care of, right? It's it's amazing how um, you know in doing reviews, and I'll get on with different organizations and say, let's do a review of your DNS authoritative infrastructure. Let's start talking about your registrar access, and they haven't done any of these stuff. It's in somebody's personal email box, or sometimes uh, the person who used to have the registrar access left the company. And they have to do a recovery of a registrar, which is not an easy thing to do sometimes, right? Um, or they have to reinstate the person who left's email address to be able to actually change the information on the registrar. Don't let that happen to you. There are guidelines that were written up um, in ICANN. There are good guidelines in, in US NIST. Um, the problem is they were very convoluted. So what happened is a bunch of us um, in, in Akamai, we kind of like summarized everything. So we put this together as an industry white paper and many organizations cut and paste with our permission to use this. It's kind of like a summarization of step one, step two, step three, covering these sort of things. So it's a good thing to kind of look at and add to, you know, um, every 
at least once a year, if not twice a year, just kind of go through the list and make sure everything between your authoritative DNS and the registrar is following these sort of um, best practice checklists that are listed out by uh, ICANN and other organizations with it. Um, some people would say, oh, with everything you're talking about, what about DNSSEC? What's interesting about DNSSEC is, you know, DNSSEC was like, is it worth it or not worth it? Is it worth it? Is it what not worth it over the years? What's going on right now is we move down a DNS encryption path and we're getting the visibility to more DNS resolvers who are doing DNS uh, SEC validation. Um, it's starting to become where it's a useful tool, right? We're actually deploying it and the cost of deploying it means you're gonna get a return on the investment of deploying it. And that was the problem with DNS SEC. Is the effort gonna be worth the benefits? Was always been the, the problem over the last you know decade plus of, of DNS sex existence. We're now getting to a point where it is becoming valid, good resource out there. So um, it's something to you know take care of everything else for DNS resiliency, and then circle back around to DNS sec. It's it's actually something to kind of look at with a different range of attacks, not on your authoritative, but on the resolver side. You know, so um, so that's something to pay 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 attention to. So. Um, now, since this is related to DOS and DNS resiliency, there are some papers out here in this presentation when you download that can help you as a good checklist of like, am I doing the right things to prepare for attack? Each one of these include check your DNS, right? So what's interesting there is, you know, if you go to the UK NCSC or you go to the NIST or you go to Australian Cybersecurity Center, or you got some of the, the work that um, I did on behalf of DDoS um, uh, working groups um, uh, that you'll find that DNS is right in the middle of it, right? You, um, so, so um, you know, these are things that if when you pull down the presentation, look through them, these are good guides that help you build overall DDoS resiliency. And DNS is one of the first things you take care of with the authoritative DNS part. If you're going to walk through, like you got to pick the priorities ones, these are the ones I send out to organizations do these first, where um, number one is you go through like 10 steps to prepare, you know, for the pain. If you know you're going to get hit with a DOS attack, here's the things to do priority. There's a lot of things you need to do, but here's the 10 things to do a priority. And then um, then you have critical security conversations because DDoS isn't protected by yourself. You know, if you're under threat of a DOS attack, it's a community response plan. Like we're first, it's a community response plan. So you'll, you know, those of people, everybody here who's part of the first community will see these seven critical security conversations as very normal from, from what we do in our community as incident responders. Um, the materials, as I mentioned, are all public. Um, if you can't find it, just remember senki.org. I take all my materials. I present, you know, wh wherever I'm at, I, I put copies of it up there so you can find it up there. You got my email addresses on that. Um, and then I'll re I'll put these also into the area in the Q&A section. And since I had a couple extra minutes here, I wanted to make sure people kind of understood these seven, seven monetization factors and related to the DNS. Um, and why, you know, it's interesting to kind of circle back around to see how these the seven habits applies to authoritative DNS. You know, they can, what, you know, so principle number one, misgrants, if I'm a criminal, I want to, you know, make money for criminal activities and not get caught. That's rule number one. If they, if they do an attack and there's a chance of tracing back to them to find them and put handcuffs on them, uh, they're not going to do it. The thing with authoritative DNS is it's so easy to put like DNS reflectors, fire up a stressor or a booter and whack the authoritative infrastructure because you can find it, they don't get caught. So it's a, that's why it's a, it's a popular sort of tool in their arsenal to go after organization. They also don't have to work too hard because if an organization hasn't done any sort of thoughts on DNS resiliency, or they did things like, oh, let's stick a firewall in front of it and make it easier to take out because I can do a, a attack against the firewall itself. Um, then they, you know, you, you, you know, they don't have to work too hard. Um, it's a cool, it, interesting tool because we see it now with the DDoS extortion. Um, pay me these bitcoins or else, whack, you get hit with a DDoS against their DNS infrastructure, right? So they, they can make money off of it. So they, they'll follow the money. They can do it now. Bitcoin, the Bitcoin um, 
you know, has made monetization of criminal activities uh, easier, easier for them. Um, they will move upstream. In other words, if, if you think that you can like have big data center resources to protect your DOS attack or stick them all behind, you know, uh, DOS defenses, they'll move up because they can trace route into the name server and they can find out which router to tack into. So those are your couple dependencies. And of course, they'll tack from all over the internet and, you know, all, all the other sort of uh, factors with it. So that is um, kind of like a little jest with it. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to Q and A's that people have uh, come on over with it. If you have questions also, and here's our little chat room there. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be there waiting around, uh, drop things into the chat so people can, you know, explore the different links. And then again, um, just uh, contact me if you have any questions directly, because a lot of times in security space, we all know that um, you don't want to ask questions publicly. Um, we go one on one. Um, I'm also on the first Slack. So you can find me on the uh, first Slack there and ask me questions on that one there. So I'm a little bit early and thank you very much. So Sean, I'll hand this back over to you. Awesome, Barry, thank you very much. And, and again, Barry will be over in the QA uh, two room in uh, Work Adventure. So I look like you already had your little icon set up and your little stage ready to go. So <laughs> excellent. Indeed. Excellent. I'd like to thank everybody who's joined us uh, today. Uh, we've had some very good talks. Please come back tomorrow. Uh, we will have more and you can join us either through the website or through the YouTube channel. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much.